Milena, welcome or welcome back to my channel. The coming two weeks I'm going to decide my reading through Instagram. So I'm going to put my faith in you guys to help me decide my reading. I'm going to do this by taking two entire weeks and using a template that I put I think on Instagram in December like many of you guys. The gist of that template is that you ask 12 recommendations from 12 friends. So I will share the template with you guys and we can very quickly and surely discuss the books that are on there. So clearly there are 12 books on here. I just own three of them. They're over here physically. Most of them I will be listening to an audiobook or I will find an ebook to read. So I've put them in a few categories so that I have a lot of variation in the next two weeks. So the first category I found um, is non-fiction. We have A Ghost in the Throat, which I think is a combination of poetry and non-fiction. It sounds very literary fiction novel in verse like. It is an Irish book and I think it's really quite recent. So that is one I found an audiobook for. Another one is Disability Visibility, which is an essay collection collected by Alice Wong. I think if I'm going to read this, it will be through ebook. And then I have one that I'm not sure whether it's a novel or non-fiction, but I will discover it later on. These are not Gentle People by Andrew Harding. I'm not sure if it is true crime or if it's a thriller based on true crime. So it's one of these two. Very outside of my comfort zone, but it might be fun to go ahead and try it. I also found an ebook for this one. And then in a the category fantasy and magical realism, I first have Crooked Kingdom, which I do own and I'm actually currently reading. I'm on page 92. I think I will read this throughout the coming two weeks, but I'm not going to really discuss it in this vlog because I'm doing a separate vlog for this book with Mary and Sarah. Sarah is going to make me read this. She's making me read this basically. So I will count it for the number of books I will read in these two weeks, but I will discuss it in the other vlog. Same goes for The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien, which is the book that Mary is going to make me read. If I read this in these two weeks I will discuss in that vlog but count it for this one as well. And then I have a book that I think is magical realism but I'm not entirely sure yet. I saw it shelved on Goodreads as magical realism so I'm just assuming that is what it is. And that is what you can see from here by Mariana Lecky. I think it is set in a small village and it's about a family. That's what I've understood so far so that sounds quite interesting as well. I think it's quite a recent one and I haven't found a digital version for it just yet. So this might be a difficult one to pick but we'll see. And of course as expected most of these books are classics. So the first one is The Return of the Soldier by Rebecca West which I also do own. So this is going to be a higher priority because of course it's on my physical TBR. Then the next one is one that actually was on my radar but I don't own a copy and that is The Black Tulip by Alexander Dumas. This is a French classic but it's set in Amsterdam so it sounds really fascinating. I've heard people say that it's incredibly tragic. I found an audiobook for it so who knows, maybe I'll listen to this one. Another classic I have is Sula by Toni Morrison, which I think I will definitely read again because it's on my physical TBR. It does have high priority, but it all depends, of course, on the Instagram polls and everything. These two are going to be high priority because they are my physical TBR. Another classic is one that has been recommended to me quite a lot and that is The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson McCullens. I'm not really sure what it's about but it really feels like a modern classic about coming of age. I think that is a big theme within this book but of course I'm not sure yet because I haven't read it. I also found an audiobook for this one. Abigail by Magda Shaspo which is a Hungarian modern classic. I did read The Door by Magda Shaspo last year which I quite liked. I didn't love it but I quite liked it and I am fascinated to read more by Magda Shelsbo. I also haven't found an audiobook or ebook yet for this one, but if it comes up, then I think I will go for the ebook for this one. And there is one book, I think it's historical fiction, but it's just I'm just going to classify it as fiction and that is The Signature of All Things by Elizabeth Gilbert. I haven't read anything by Elizabeth Gilbert yet but I am quite fascinated by her because I feel like she's a favorite for a lot of people. I saw that this one was really really chunky and I cannot find an audiobook of that one so I think I might save this one for later in the year when I really can take my time for it. It would of course be so satisfying if I can read a high number of books within these two weeks. It would be most satisfying but most importantly of course I want to enjoy my my reading and I really want to make some time to do a bit more reading than usual in these two weeks. What I'm going to do right now is record a clip for Instagram and I'm going to ask you guys to pick an audiobook for me. So I think I'm going to do two options of the books that I have audiobooks for. I will let you know in about 24 hours what Instagram decides for me. And as far as physical books go, I think I'm definitely going to read more of this because I already started it and then get maybe a classic on audiobook. Once I finish that, 
I will have Instagram pick one of these two. <laughs> okay, let's see which boo won. Okay, we got a very clear winner. The Black Tulip by Alexandra Duma was 64%. So that's a really clear winner. And I'm excited to read this one. I also did kind of expect that this one would win because it's such a famous name. I'm pretty pleased that he won. Blackstone Audio presents The Black Tulip by Alexandra Duma. Read by Rosalind Landau. Chapter 1. A Grateful People. On the 20th of August, 1672, the city of The Hague, always so lively, so neat, and so trim that one might believe every day to be Sunday, with its shady park, with its tall trees, spreading over its gothic houses, with its canals like large mirrors, in which its steeples and its almost eastern cupolas are reflected, the city of The Hague, the capital of the seven united provinces, was swelling in all its arteries with a black and red stream of hurried, panting voices. Hi, it is day three of this challenge and I have nearly finished Crooked Kingdom. I have been so involved with this book, but again, I will talk about this book in the other vlog. I have about 50 pages to go in this book, so I will be reading that tonight. I am about two hours into The Black Tulip. I'm listening on it on 1.25 speed and I have four and a half hours left. Usually I would spend more time listening to audiobooks, but... This one has been really grasping my attention. Because I've almost finished this, I will definitely need another physical read as an option for tomorrow and the days after that. So I posted a poll. Okay, oh, there's a really clear winner. So I posted this poll on Instagram. I hope you can see. So I put Sula and The Return of the Soldier as my next physical read, which are the two books that I own. And I asked you guys which one I should read. And can you see it? Sula is a really, really clear winner with... 84% so I guess it is very clear that I'm going to read Sula as my next physical read and I will pop in here before that I think to discuss the black tulip which I'm sure I will finish somewhere this week. Really kind of depends on the kind of activities I'm going to do that I need audiobooks for. Um, I'm certainly not going to do anything like cleaning wise because my back is just killing me lately so I will I will not be doing a lot of activities, but we'll see and I'll update you. And I'm going to read Sula, which I'm really very excited for. Hi, it is day six of this challenge. So we're almost one week in and I am now halfway through Sula. So Sula is about two friends called Sula and Nell. And they grow up in this little town. They meet in this little town. The book is basically a history of a generation of women. We have Eva, who is the grandmother. We have her daughters and their daughters. And there is a really prolific theme within this book that I find incredibly disturbing. I think the theme is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger and therefore this will definitely not be my favorite Toni Morrison book is if what I'm predicting is true because I'm predicting that both murder and death are really big in this book and I feel like Toni Morrison is trying to discover the humanity within this generation of women and within the generational trauma that is within this family. A big part of that is that these, these women I think are not very profoundly connected to their emotions and to different actions that should cause certain emotions but that don't cause those emotions. That is what I've so far understood. I think that's where it's going and it's making me incredibly uncomfortable. There's a lot of 
tragic part. There's a lot of gore. And I'm used to a little bit of gore from Toni Morrison. So I'm kind of okay with that. The way the characters respond with so little emotion is so... Ooh, it's so eerie and it's so unexpected. I did not expect to find that in this book. My expectations were just really a friendship between Sula and Nell, but it's so much more. It's not a fake book. I will read this relatively fast. I think I will finish it relatively fast and I will talk to you about that when I do. But I don't think this will end up being a favorite Toni Morrison's of mine. Even though I see all the value, I see all that it's a good book, things like that. I don't think it's going to be a favorite because Oof, it's a tough one. Hi, it is Thursday evening. It is cold. I'm in the car and we're going to the city center. Hopefully getting some books at the bookstore. Hopefully. I think it's open, but I never really know how the restrictions prevent them from being open late at night or late at night. It is seven o'clock, which is late at night for me. But if they're open, I'll take you along. <laughs> great time at the bookstore because they had three editions of Beloved. Three! Um, if I hadn't had already bought the pretty edition, I would definitely have bought it tonight. But I did get two other books. I hope you can see me by the way. So I got an essay collection by Zadie Smith called NW and I slightly remember Lana telling me I needed to read this over a year ago now. But oh my god, oh my goodness. <laughs> that was a car update film. <laughs> um, but these or is it a novel, you know? I don't know. But I did want to read something by Sadie Smith again after reading Swing Time. So, yeah. <laughs> I love the idea of reading more Sadie Smith. So, um, and I know it is about, it is set in London. It's about London life. And I'm going to hold the camera now because we have a lot of cobblestones in the Netherlands. And another book I got is by a slightly favorite Brazilian author, Clarice Lispector. And I got The, the Seagulled Sea, which I don't really know what it is about, but it's Clarice Lispector, so I'm sure I'll have a good time. And it will be really vague and really ambiguous, but fun and interesting nonetheless. So those are the two books that I got. I did also want to find the book club read, but I didn't have that one, so I'll have to order that online anyway. Um, did you have a good time, boy? Zeker. Top. Those are like the most Dutch words you could possibly <laughs> have used. You said definitely, and what a stoppy, I don't know. Swe Great. Swe <laughs> swell. We had a swell time. Yeah, I'm going to uh, log off now. Bye. <laughs> Hi, 
it's Sunday afternoon and it is day 8 of this challenge so we're quite a bit in and I did finish two books. I finished Sula by Toni Morrison and I finished uh, The Black Tulip by Alexandre Dumas. Today is a high fatigue day. I mean don't get fooled by the fact that I wear makeup. It's pajama bottoms and fluffy Christmas socks all the way today <laughs> and coffee. Usually with high fatigue day coffee can be a bit do or don't but I just go with my gut and today I want coffee so I slept until 11.30 which especially early on in my fatigue journey was a big no-go but I've discovered that how I'm doing right now if I need it I need it and it shouldn't be a habit because then I could sleep very late but sometimes I just need to sleep for 12 hours and I feel so much better I think maybe possibly I've overdone it a bit this week but that's kind of okay that happens because I did have a lot of fun I mean going to the bookstore was a very spontaneous thing in the evening and I had, had already done quite a lot that day so I knew I would pay for it later but it was worth it because I don't really get to do those kind of things a whole lot it was really nice to do something like that together again so even though I'm paying for it now which is okay. I need to tell myself that's okay. It's just how things work when you have chronic fatigue. Sometimes you do something and you pay a high price of having a high fatigue day, two or three high fatigue days. That's kind of how it works. But let's talk about books. Because I did finish Sula by Toni Morrison. I ended up giving it four stars as I predicted. Not my favorite Morrison, but there was a big big theme in here that's basically the entire book that I appreciated so much and that is female sexuality because um, I'm going to put this down because high fatigue days holding up things heavy <laughs> so I hope that's okay that you can see the cover so we have Nell and Sula who are best friends and I did throughout the book really wonder if there was a queer undertone within this book it's not discussed like explicitly it would make a lot of sense within all the other things that I saw so female sexuality is very present I think the origin of the book of the idea of the way the women are portrayed is in a way that Eve is portrayed in the Bible. So she does things that are unacceptable and unacceptable things for women or for Eve was to have desire, sexual desire, to be tempted by something darker than her patriarch Adam. And all of these women seem to be connected to Eve. Even the grandmother is called Eve. So that's kind of why I thought that might be a theme within the book because all of the women they like men but men to them are what women are often to men in 20th century literature so they are vessels they function because of the men in the books and in Sula it's kind of the other way around the men function because of the women in the book and they are there because of the women either to give them a livelihood which is mentioned a few times so an occupation that occupation being a wife but also sexual desire because especially Sula and Sula's mother as well they just have a lot of sex with a lot of different men. Death by fire is a really big part of this book as well. That's why I kind of made that connection with Eve and with hell and heaven. Um, you know, the hell fire, uh, death by fire, which kind of seems to me like a hint that because of their sexual desire and their sexual behavior, fire is their punishment. So that was super, super interesting to me, that entire theme throughout this book. I'm definitely going to, I think, I mean, Toni Morrison is so interesting, so I think I might watch an interview if there is still one available about Sula and I will get back to this a little bit more in my wrap up. Just wanted to mention that the whole sexual part was really interesting to me, but the more gore and emotional part was not my favorite. It was really good, but it's just not something that I love to read about. So that's why it's not a favorite. Toni Morrison and not a five star. I also finished The Black Tulip by Alexandre Dumas. This was a three star for me. And I don't think I've talked about this book at all yet. I will tell you what it is about because it was quite fun for for me to read because it's set in the Netherlands, it's set in Holland, which Holland is a part of the Netherlands. This book takes place in the 17th century and back then you had different states in the Netherlands so you didn't have the Netherlands, you just had seven states that were all independent but they did have like a combined government together. So this takes place in Holland which is one of those states, like the most powerful biggest state in which you have all the cities, Amsterdam, The Hague, Leiden, uh, Haarlem, which all, it, I think it doesn't even take place in Amsterdam we have Haarlem and Den Haag, so the Hague, I think, where this takes place. But we follow the most famous execution in Dutch history. We all learned about this in school and that is about the Gebroeders de Wit. They were two political figures who were killed 
in public because of their beliefs. We follow that part of the book, that's how the book starts out, and then we follow one of their godsons, Cornelis van Balen. His godson is in prison because he received a letter from his godfather. They think he was part of their political beliefs. So he is imprisoned, and in prison he meets the jailer's daughter called Rosa, and they start to develop a bond. One of the most funny, I think it is funny, but it gives the book purpose, is the fact that Cornelis van Balen wants to create the black tulip, which is a flower that has not yet been developed. He has three bulbs, so tulip bulbs, and he asks Rosa to plant them for him. And it's in his entire life, it feels like it is a biggest government plot possible, like an entire war depends on it. That's how important it is to him and to you as a reader in the book. Because if he succeeds, he can earn a hundred thousand gulden, I believe. Gulden is a Dutch currency before we had the euro. So that was kind of a lot of fun. It was not that fun to hear the audiobook narrator say all the Dutch words wrong, but it's okay, I got over it. I think overall this was a very fast-paced book. It was very adventurous, and I feel like what I've heard from the Count of Monte Cristo, I think it's really Dumas' his way of writing, to be very dramatic, very explanatory, and it's just not the writing I vibe with most. So I didn't love it that much. It was boring for me at times, because I feel like there was so much told and explained in the book then was necessary. So I did not love that, but I can definitely see how it's incredibly appealing if you do like that writing style, because it feels epic. It feels like an epic story, but I just didn't care that much. I did really like the Dutch setting and the Dutch history, because I feel like even growing up in the Netherlands, I have not really read a lot about Dutch history in fiction. I think even Dutch authors don't really write about that time period a whole lot, just mainly very heavy non-fiction, but not an adventure story. So I did like that. The female character... It is like the typical story of a young girl, very much younger than all the men in her life, having no motivations except for her relationships towards the two men, so towards Cornelis van Balen and her father, the jailer. She did develop a little bit more, because what I did like is that the author acknowledged that uh, a woman from her standing in her time would probably not be able to read or write, and Cornelis teaches her to read and write, and we do follow her development within that, so we don't just follow her development in a romantic storyline, but also in an intellectual storyline. I did like that, but of course I would have preferred it if she had had some motivations of her own and not just towards the men in her life, which I think is a trope that is so so common in literature written by men. And that is why I read so many books by women, because after years of literature education I was so done with that. Dumas is forgiven because it, it, it rounds up nicely. Definitely not a favorite, but I really do like that I've read something by Dumas because I feel like his books and his stories are so famous and have so many film adaptations that I, of course, have seen. And I like that I've been introduced into his writing and that I can kind of connect that. Don't think I will read more by Dumas, especially because his other books are so thick. Because I feel so neutral about this book, I just don't think I can round up the motivation to read an entire book, even though I do think like The Mount of Monte Cristo is his best book, I believe. So it's probably better than this one, but yeah, I don't think I can find the motivation for that. I finished these two books yesterday, so I did already put on polls on Instagram for another physical read and for another audiobook, so uh, let's see, let's see. For audiobooks, I asked you guys I should listen to The Signature of All Things by Elizabeth Gilbert or The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson McCullens. This was really close, but 57% said The Heart is a Lonely Hunter by Carson McCullens. Not a super clear winner, but a winner nonetheless. And for an ebook, I had two ebooks for this one. So I had What You Can See From Here by Mariana Lecky, which is translated from the German. And These Are Not Gentle People by Andrew Harding. This had a bit of a clear winner with... 61% for Mariana Lecky. I'm going to read this in Dutch, first of all, because the translation is cheaper for me. But second of all, I think German and Dutch are so close together, so I think that the Dutch translation will be a bit closer to the original than the English translation. I think I have about five days left of this challenge. I know that the ebook isn't that big, so if I spend a lot of time reading today, I will probably need another physical read. I don't think I'm going to have time for another audiobook because Carson McCullen's audiobook is about 12 hours long. This is the only book on my physical TBR that I didn't get to from this challenge, so if I have days left over for another physical book, I will read this one, and I will give you, of course, another update.
Hi, good morning. I look like the morning. I decided to DNF the hardest lonely hunter because I just really wasn't feeling it. So of course I had to ask Instagram whether I should DNF it and most of you said that I should. So I asked you guys what other audiobook I should listen to and I didn't have any like light-hearted audiobooks that I really was in the mood for. So I decided to just pick two books from my TBR. So I had Shadow and Bone and A Castle on the Clouds. It was a really close call but most of you said A Castle on the Clouds. So I started listening to that. Wow, this is a cat bot. <laughs> Bella, honestly. It is written by Kirsten Gear and translated from the German to English. I did finish my physical read, um, which I loved. It's my favorite book of this challenge. I gave it five stars, but I will talk to you about that book when I look a bit more presentable, <laughs> when I have the time to sit down for a bit. And Bella is not claiming everything. Honestly, Bella. So because I finished my physical read, I decided to start to read The Return of the Soldier by Rebecca West. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Of course, listen to the castle in the clouds. And I will get back to you once we are going to wrap up this vlog. And then we will talk about three more books. Hopefully, if I finish them, of course. Welcome to the last day of this challenge. I have finished some books. I have finished three books. One audiobook, which was The Castle on the Clouds by Kirsten Gear, And I finished The Return of the Soldier and what you can see from here. So I'm here to wrap this up and to quickly chat to you about the three books I finished. I will get into these books a little bit more in my monthly wrap up because I think if I do that here, we're going to have an hour long vlog. And let's just not do that. Let's just not do that. This morning, I finished The Return of the Soldier by Rebecca West. The book is very short. It's only 140 pages. And what I really love about this book is that it was written right at the end of World War One, so in 1918. And Rebecca West was only 24 at the time, so you can really imagine how she was just in the midst of the First World War and how so many men that she knew went into war, which must have been such a heartbreaking experience. Because The Return of the Soldier is about a man called Chris. He goes to war and he returns shell shock but in a way that he's seemingly fine and it's, he seems to be okay but he has forgotten the last 15 years of his life which apparently i read a little bit of the introduction was not very common but it did happen a lot to soldiers who were shell shocked as a effect of a way to deal with all the horrors that they saw follow the perspective of his younger cousin who lives with him and his wife and he has been married for 10 years so if he's forgotten the last 15 years of his life he's clearly forgotten his wife as well and he can only remember his younger sweetheart who is now 15 years older of course and they're all in their mid 30s but he remembers still being a 21 year old boy falling in love with someone he met on vacation. When the war office writes a letter, they write to that woman, to his childhood sweetheart, who receives a letter that he is wounded and that he's in a hospital in France. So she visits his wife and his cousin to tell them the news. Of course, he comes home to his wife, but he has forgotten her. He does remember his cousin, but he still remembers her as a 20-year-old girl. The first bit of the book I was very observational, very descriptive. I liked it, but I think you can tell that Rebecca West was still earlier in her career. I have really high hopes for her later books because I think there's so much potential in this. And I really did like the ending. I wasn't planning on giving this five star, but the ending is making me doubting whether I should. Not because it was like a really big reveal ending, but just because it was done so incredibly well. For the time, we're in 1918. Uh, shell shock and mental health and trauma through war. It's something that doctors got wrong so often and the fact that Rebecca West clearly did some research and just was aware of her time when she wrote this and that she did understand it is just what I love most about this book I guess. Of course because Chris is shell shocked he visits a doctor and the doctor talks to all the three women in Chris's lives. They have a conversation with the doctor as well because of course the doctor wants their help. He wants to know whether there are certain events in Chris's past that would trigger him to forget the last 15 years. His wife is called Kitty. She clearly doesn't understand the aspect of mental illness. And they have this short dialogue which I thought was just amazing and shows how amazingly clever Rebecca West was. So I will read this to you and totally forget what I said earlier about not going in too deep because I cannot help myself. I've always said, declared Kitty, with an air of good sense that if he would make an effort, effort, he jerked his round head about, so the doctor. The mental life 
that cannot be controlled by effort isn't the mental life that matters. You've been stuffed up when you were young with talk about a thing called self-control. A sort of war mate of the soul that says, time's up gentlemen, and here you've had enough. There's no such thing. There's a deep self in one, the essential self, that has its wishes. And if those wishes are suppressed by the superficial self, the self that makes, as you say, efforts and usually makes them with the sole idea of putting up a good show before the neighbors, it takes its revenge. Into the house of conduct erected the superficial self, it sends an obsession, which doesn't, owing to a twist that the superficial self, which isn't candid, gives it seems to bear any relation to the suppressed witch. I had to read this part about three times before I really knew what the doctor was saying, but I think it's really admirable. Boy is calling me. Hey, babe. Oh, okay, I'm going to take the Ema for you for uh, pantoffels. Oh, thanks. Will you 41, 42 or 43? 42, 43. I think I will give this like a 4.5 or a high 4. I don't know. But it's just, it's really interesting. And I think if you really like to read about war stories, but you've always found yourself reading it from only the soldier's perspective, then I would definitely recommend this. My audiobook I finished was really, really cute. We follow Sophie, who is a 17 year old girl who goes to work in a hotel in the clouds. <laughs> a hotel on a mountain that is very snowy. So she starts working at the hotel, but the hotel owner is really not a nice person, but his son is who also starts working at the hotel. This is just a story of Sophie and her internship and all of her colleagues. And there's also a secret cat in the hotel that's not supposed to be there, but who is there and who sleeps with Sophie in her bed. She has a lot of lovely friends, a big family of American girls visit the hotel who are very loud and obnoxious, but mainly a lot of fun. I thought the first half of the book was quite slow in just Sophie doing her thing, which I usually really like, but maybe I would have loved it a little bit more if he had a bit more of a build up towards the second part of the story. This is YA, by the way, in which we get mysteries and romances, which I really, really enjoyed. So of course, because it's a YA novel, we have two love interests. I really did like the eventual love interest. I really did like him best. I would have loved a little bit more yearning, a little bit more built up towards their romance because it was just a little bit too tame. I would have loved a little bit more yearning, a little bit more being actually in love, more adventure in the romance. The adventure within the mystery was really, really fun. And I think that's one of the things I liked best about this book. So it's really just a really relaxing, enjoyable book. Maybe nothing special. So it's probably like a 3.5 for me. And if you want a chill, fun read that's decently written, then I would definitely recommend it. And then we're going to end on possibly my favorite book of this challenge. I think it is in line with Sula. I didn't give that one five stars because I rated it within the realm of Toni Morrison. Everything gets compared to Beloved and it's just not as good as Beloved. I think it is as good as the book I'm going to talk Talk about now, which I did give five stars because it just perfectly did what it's supposed to do. This is another book translated from the German. I know the book has won some prizes and I can definitely see why. What we can see from here is a really fun and cozy literary fiction, which is, I don't think, something that we get a whole lot, a fun and cozy literary fiction. It is that kind of literary fiction that, for me, is very typical Dutch literary fiction that is written very well and with a lot of love and compassion, which is written from childhood experiences, because in the first half of the book, we meet our main character as a young girl with her best friend, and they all live in this small village in Germany. The childlike wonder is such a big part of the writing in this book and I feel like that's a really big part in I guess Western European fiction. I haven't seen it a lot in English fiction but Dutch and German fiction is something I see a lot that the childhood wonder is not necessarily something you see as a theme but you see as a really big writing tool. So when the adults do things that are just ordinary to us you take a child's perspective and see how they react to that and that often is really just fun and cute to read but it's not done in a middle grade way. It's done in a very literary way. So everything that the kids encounter have a meaning are in some way a metaphor for something that happens to them later in life. And I just love it. I loved how cute and lovely the writing was, but also incredibly literary and meaningful at the same time. This book deals with a lot of love and grief in a very human way. I love it that all the characters in these books aren't amazingly important. They're very ordinary characters and I think if you move to this town, they will probably 
come off as quite boring, as quite uneventful. One character isn't even called by his first name, just by his profession. He's an optometrist, I think is the English word. And he just has this small store who you can just sense that his clientele has just gone down in the last two decades. He's in his 70s. But still, he is such a compassionate and kind man who really deeply cares about a few people in his life. And I really enjoyed that about this book, just how ordinary and maybe boring people have incredibly beautiful and layered emotions, even though they may not have these spectacular lives. It doesn't mean that your emotional life and your love life isn't spectacular because of the way you feel about it. And that's really the sense I got from this book and what I loved so dearly. It is called Magical Realism. My relation with Magical Realism is always that I'm like, oh, okay, well, it wasn't that important to me. I guess I just don't know a lot about it quite yet. The magical realism part is that we have the grandmother called Selma who dreams about the Okapi, which those animals are just, they are a dream. And that is why it's used, of course, because she didn't know that Okapi was a real animal. She thought she had dreamed it because it looks kind of like a giraffe. It looks like a zebra. Um, it just lo looks like a cross of a lot of different mammals. I once saw one. A few years ago, maybe 10 years ago now, I remember Boy and I went on our second or third date. We went to a zoo and they had an okapi. It was a magical experience because I had no idea what I was looking at. I had never seen a photo of an okapi and I just saw it right in front of me and I was trying to make sense of what I was seeing. I was like, am I seeing some sort of deer? It was my first thought that it was a type of deer, but then I got closer and I was, no, it's too big to be a deer. It was, it was amazing. So I definitely get why the author choose to use an okapi as a death omen because every time Selma dreams of an okapi someone dies. And that is where the novel starts out with people thinking that there's going to be a death because Selma dreamt of an okapi. I just really love this. I think this is the best type of literary fiction in which some traditions are used but only like the good ones because I think there's so, especially in certain European literary fiction there are reoccurring themes that are incredibly racist and sexist and that are just tiring me out. There was a point where I was feeling like, are we going to get another sexual assault in this book that does absolutely nothing for the story and it's just some kind of shock factor just to have it in there, which I feel so often happens with literary fiction. I feel so often authors use an event like that without really knowing what they're doing and without really treating it with respect. And I was so glad to not see the author fall in those kind of literary fiction tropes, but just making a beautiful, beautiful book. And I'm so interested in reading more by this author. Yes, I've blabbed too much about the books. I apologize. I think either that one or Sula is my favorite of this vlog, but I think I'm going to go for literary fiction as my favorite because I had no expectations for the book. I had no idea what I was getting into and it was a big surprise. Of course I expected to love Toni Morrison because it's Toni Morrison. I think my least favorite book was Alexandra Dumas because it just really wasn't my type of writing but I do like that I read something by him. Overall I did have fun and I did read five out of the 12 books but I'm also going to cross off Carson McCullens because I DNF'd it but I did start reading it and I don't really have any interest in trying it again. So that means that half of the template is left and probably in a few months time I will read the other six in two weeks. I think. For now, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, then don't forget to subscribe and I hope that you have a lovely, lovely day or evening and I hope to see you in another video. Bye!